So without further ado, I would like to introduce the next speaker who is also going to show you some new innovation. And her name is Gemma Clay. She works at Hills. Uh, she's a research scientist. She's a PhD. She is a specialist in nutrition. And she did something with tying up horses, I saw in her CV. So uh, that's probably the disease, not the tying up of the horses itself. Um, and something with nutrition. Uh, she is a wonderful speaker. And I'm so happy to have her here because she's going to tell us something about the diet that everybody is talking about, which is Durham Defense. And I keep on talking a little bit because she's still in almost there and uh, so it's really ha I'm really happy to have uh, Jen here here she is big hand of applause for Jen McClay oh, how's everybody doing really good this has been a great um, couple of days even for me mostly because uh, I love the idea when we can t uh, take an idea and look at it from all different angles and it struck me as I was sitting over there we are really redefining the idea of multimodal therapy if I was to sum it up in one sentence that's what it would be this idea that multimodal therapy is not a bunch of different medications. We are expanding our horizons as to what it means for these pets, these pet parents. Everything from the wearables that we were just introducing to you to the idea of food. And it's not just food. We're going to talk about that as we go. Uh, but the idea of client communication and how we can always improve upon that. I think if there's anything that we've learned as lifelong learners in veterinary medicine, it's that's one of the things that we always strive to be better at as people, as humans, as veterinarians. So I'm deeply honored to share with you today some of the nutritional technology that we've incorporated into Derm Defense because it's truly moving that bar as I I've already mentioned. We're going to talk about how derm defense can be integrated into the treatment of canine atopic dermatitis because we firmly believe that nutrition is an essential piece in that comprehensive management of the disease. We're going to talk about how derm defense helps restore and stabilize the skin barrier and balance immune function and how incorporating nutrition into a proactive treatment plan can result in milder disease and delayed and ideally decreased use of medications. Atopic dermatitis is a chronic skin disease which requires permanent treatment. This is a quote from Dr. Andreas Wollenberg. And what I really love about this quote is that it emphasizes that while treatment has to be adjusted uh, to a particular patient, to a particular season, to a particular year, it also is not just necessary, it's essential. We've heard this from many veterinarians as we started to introduce the idea of derm defense for environmental uh, sensitivities. And that is, as a veterinarian, it is just so difficult to talk about food because you're asking us to do something new when I also need to educate my clients about the disease and what the disease is and about bathing and changing the environment and cleaning the pet and medications and cleaning their house. And it's really difficult. And this is the question I have in return. What is the one recommendation you can offer your pet parents that they are 100% going to comply with? They're going to feed their pet every day. <laughs> At least we hope they do. <laughs> They're going to feed their pet every day. And what is the foundation of health? We believe it's nutrition. We're a nutrition-based company. We are nutritionists. We're veterinarians. We firmly believe in that the foundation of health is going to come from basic nutrition. And this is an insight that we gained when we talked to pet parents. We feel like we're out of control. The dog is ruling the household. She's itching all the time. We can't sleep. We can't uh, uh, do everything that we want to do. We, we take our dog out for a walk, and nobody wants to touch the dog because the dog looks really nasty. <laughs> um, but we also know that pet parents are extraordinarily open to the idea of nutrition as the foundation of health. They preach it to us all the time. And um, we know that pet parents have a real desire for multiple solutions when it comes to uh, canine atopic dermatitis. So we're very excited uh, that we can uh, offer them some control. 
So how do you get your pet parents to feel more empowered? We're going to do a poll question. So grab your devices. You can teach them about the disease. You can explain to them that there is no single cure. You can let them know that you're going to work with them to help find the best combination of medications and environmental mo modification uh, to help them manage their disease. You're going to encourage them to adopt some basic strategies around early intervention and pretreatment or of course all of the above. Multiple choice question, you always have to have that in there, right? <laughs> Smart group. And why? Because you all know how to take multiple choice questions, right? So you're already doing one, two, and three, and therefore four has to be part of the mix as well. So even if you don't understand a little bit about proactive treatment, we're gonna talk about that in the next uh, half an hour or so. Actually, even a little sooner than that. So let's talk about pretreatment because um, it's also known as proactive therapy as part of early intervention. When we know fundamentally that whenever we have an inflammatory process, the more things we can do to control that inflammatory process before it really revs up, the better off we're going to be. And we can do that nutritionally, we can do that pharmaceutically, and we can do it both together because they're very compatible. We know that um, we use this idea when we talk about uh, wind up with pain. So uh, either you yourself, if you're undergoing a surgical procedure or your veterinary patients, it's always better to get those pain meds on board ahead of time because ultimately the severity of the pain is going to be less. We know that it's better in anti-endotoxic events. So if we get our anti or, or endotoxic events, so if we get our anti-endotoxic medications on board earlier, the better off our patients will be. And it's true with allergies as well. So perhaps you've noticed commercials on television that advocate taking your antihistamines earlier on in the allergy season. And perhaps you're already talking to your patients about that too. The earlier we get those medications on board, the less severe those medica uh, the less severe the flare-ups and the clinical signs that we're going to see are. Let's look at that in the context of dermatology. This is um, a, a, a graph from a paper a human paper uh, on atopic dermatitis, where we talk about in the beginning. Um, human researchers have found that pretreatment uh, results in fewer outbreaks and less medication. In the beginning, therapy was generally recommended only when clinical signs were the most severe. Um, over time, since we've learned that atopic skin is always abnormal, then some level of occult inflammation is always occurring. And so we've moved to a recommendation where therapy uh, should begin at the earliest signs of a flare-up. And by doing that, the severity of the flare is suppressed. And further, when they continue treatment on skin that even looks normal, we know fundamentally that skin is abnormal, that the, inter uh, the interval between flares gets longer and longer, and ideally, we can prevent flares altogether. So this is that idea of pretreatment or proactive therapy. There have been many papers in human medicine looking at this involving hundreds of patients, it's still relatively new in veterinary medicine. This is one of the first papers that I know about um, in, uh, in a group of dogs, and it was um, published online in January, just came out in print this very month, where they found that there is a three and a half fold lower risk of flare in dogs that were pretreated with this particular medication. So it's an idea that's growing. And we're going to talk a little bit about the evidence for it in some of the uh, external trials that we did with germ defense. So pretreatment involves that idea of skin barrier stabilization, which can be best accomplished using nutrition and medications. We do it externally through the use of medications, changing the environment, and then again, because there's always that smoldering inflammation under the surface in these particular patients, we can do it internally with that idea of nutrition and systemic medications as well. The goal of pretreatment is to build the skin barrier so that we can ultimately reduce that hypersensitive immune response uh, to antigens, which manifests itself as canine atopic dermatitis. So let's talk about how derm defense accomplishes this. 
Derm Defense has three primary actions. When we sat down to, des uh, to design this food, uh, there were three major things that we really wanted the food to accomplish. Of course, at the very basic level, fundamental skin and coat health. That is what Hills is all about. We know how to do it. We've been doing it for a heck of a long time. And, uh, and we knew that we were going to start there. We wanted to restore the skin barrier because we know that these particular patients have extra challenges. And lastly, we needed to inhibit that inflammatory response. So, skin and coat health. Nutritionally, we want to provide high-quality sources of protein. For example, tyrosine, uh, an amino acid, is very uh, fundamental uh, as a precursor for melanin. We wanted to increase... Uh, uh, make sure that we included adequate amounts of N6 fatty acids because they're essential for keratinization. We mentioned that yesterday uh, in that talk um, uh, as well. You need to have uh, adequate amounts of fatty acids so that we can have a healthy stratum corneum and reduce transepidermal water loss. We need to have N3 fatty acids in there because we want to be sure that uh, we have their anti-inflammatory effects as well. We need to include vitamin A, also essential for epidermal cell maturation, vitamin E as an antioxidant, but, uh, B vitamins because they're necessary for energy metabolism, and we know that skin is a highly metabolic organ. We need to make sure that we include zinc and copper because they're highly involved in keratin, enzyme functions uh, within the skin, and of course overall collagen health. When we talk about restoring the skin barrier, many of the same uh, nutritional components that I just mentioned certainly apply here as well. And uh, they're also very important in uh, reducing that transepidermal water loss, which can be a big problem in CAD patients. And that overall makes the skin more resilient in the face of environmental allergens. <laughs> Lastly, we wanted to in inhibit that inflammatory response that's quite exuberant in these particular patients. And as you know, when we provide more N3 fatty acids and when the ratio of N6 to N3 fatty acids is relatively low, we get a shift in the cell membranes towards incorporating those N3 fatty acids. And that uh, when those membrane, uh, and the membrane of those particular cells is subsequently injured or under oxidative pressure, it's those N3 fatty acids that give rise to less inflammatory acosinoids, such as thromboxanes and leukotrienes and that sort of thing. What really makes Derm Defense game-changing is what we've decided to call the Histogard Complex. This is a proprietary blend of antioxidants and polyphenols and egg. And the goal of the Histogard Complex is to stabilize mast cells and other effector cells within the um, immune system and therefore I reduce histamine and cytokine release. So I imagine you're quite intrigued about the egg. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> I heard it, of course. Thank you. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the egg. Uh, in some preliminary work that we did, we uh, examined the effects of dietary egg on wheel size using an interdermal skin test. The idea of egg as having immuno immunomodulary effects is actually not so uh, far-fetched. If you think about an egg, it is uh, all the components within an egg, within egg white, within egg yolk, the idea is that it's there to protect that growing embryo. And it's not a closed system eggs respirate, they're exposed to the environment. So there are many immunomodulatory uh, things in egg. In this particular study, what we looked at is a food uh, that did not uh, contain any egg, a food that, a group of dogs that consumed a food that did not contain any egg and were also exposed to immunosuppressive doses of prednisone, and then the third group consumed a food that contained egg. We had three groups of five dogs. They consumed the food uh, for a 12-week um, prospective controlled clinical uh, mask feeding trial. And we looked at uh, their reaction to a novel antigen. So those dogs, again, were exposed to the prednisone in the prednisone group for uh, the entire study. It started at 2.2 milligrams per kilogram every other day and then was increased to every day. In the last week of the study, the dogs were exposed to a novel antigen at weeks 9 and 11 and then experienced the intradermal skin test in week 12, and we uh, looked at the wheel reactions to that antigen after 24, uh, immediately after 24 hours and after 72 hours. I'm just going to share with you the uh, immediate and the 24-hour data because the 72-hour data looked exactly like the 24-hour data. 
And what we saw was that pretreatment with prednisone resulted in similar reductions in the wheel size immediately and at 24 hours as the uh, group that consumed the dietary egg. So that's to say that the dampening of the immune response was similar in the group consuming the egg as was exposed to the prednisone, which is pretty profound. So we knew we wanted to include egg. Uh, we, we then turned our attention to the next component in derm defense that we knew that we had to include, and that was polyphenols. Polyphenols come from fruits, vegetables, green tea. Uh, they function as antioxidants, and they stabilize mast cells and decrease the release of cytokines. It's a fantastic area of research. If uh, you're interested in the, in the area of mast cells in general and polyphenols as well, uh, it's a huge growing area of research. For example, in 2015 alone, I did a, uh, I did a Google, Scholar search, Google Scholar search over the um, uh, period of beginning to end of 2015, and what I found was almost 19,000 scientific hits for mast cells, 6,000 citations for mast cells and nutrition, almost 2,000 for mast cells and polyphenols, because the two are highly interactive, and for the trifecta of mast cells and polyphenols and nutrition, almost 1,000 different scientific uh, 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 citations. So that is a huge number, very growing area of research. We know that polyphenols are very, uh, are very powerful in their effect on the immune system, and we we're very excited to include that technology into derm defense. And why do we care about mast cells? Well, mast cells are more than just histamine. Mast cells mediate um, the recruitment of monocytes, macrophages, T cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, they produce all sorts of different um, uh, mediators from lipid mediators of inflammation, such as leukotrienes and prostaglandins and platelet activating factor, to um, preformed mediators, so not just histamine, but uh, heparin and proteases and that sort of thing. And all of these things can have a very profound effect on epidermal tight junctions. This is just one paper that I picked out of the very many that are out on the internet. And the one reason why I picked it was because it really spoke to me along the idea that in this particular paper, quercetin, which is a polyphenol and uh, is found in things like apple and cranberry, uh, can, uh, was actually found in this particular study in humans uh, with contact dermatitis and photosensitivity to be as good as chromalin, which is a very well-known mast cell stabilizer. So how do we know that these botanicals would have similar uh, effects in dogs? Because in pilot work that we've done, we've examined similar polyphenols as those found in derm defense and found that they have a profound effect in decreasing itching, in decreasing hair loss, and decreasing erythema of the skin. And we also have looked at a whole myriad of cytokines, and uh, rather than show you 50 uh, <laughs> graphs of each cytokine going down, I figured there would be one in particular that you might be most interested in, and that is interleukin-31. So as we know from our talks yesterday, interleukin-31 is the primary interleukin that's involved in itch, and this is one of the ones of many that we've looked at that have been decreased uh, when we look at the botanicals that are included in derm defense. We also knew that we wanted to include uh, antioxidants in the derm defense formula. Uh, and aside from the eggs and the polyphenols, uh, we wanted to include vitamin E and lipoic acid as very potent antioxidants. We know that, for example, uh, vitamin E, when we feed it, increases blood levels of vitamin E, but when you increase blood levels of vitamin E, we also see increased levels of vitamin E in the skin. And so why do we care about vitamin E and antioxidants in skin? I think we saw a great insight into that yesterday. Uh, it's because antioxidants are important to the skin because as a barrier, it is uniquely challenged by the environment. So skin is exposed to UV radiation, environmental pollutants, even the normal commensals on the skin, the normal skin microbiota produces uh, quite a bit of oxidative uh, tension, oxidative uh, reactive oxygen, 
uh, reactive oxygen radicals within the skin, and that can lead to uh, stress on the skin cells themselves. So, uh, and that causes the epidermis to go ahead and release uh, acosinoids and cytokines. So, by affecting those, we can affect the amount of uh, stress that the skin is under. So in summary, the histogard complex is designed to stabilize the mast cells and other effector cells within the immune system. But what about the balance of the food? We can't have a food with just those things. <laughs> uh, at Hills Pet Nutrition, we have uh, quite an extensive group that looks at gene expression and pathway analysis to help us find other ingredients uh, with antioxidant and other benefits. So what we can do is we can look at different ingredients. We can pass them through uh, target cell lines. We can then do RNA extraction uh, and look at the different uh, metabolites uh, within those uh, extracts. We can look at those metabolites uh, uh, in a database and look at pathway analysis to determine which pathways those particular metabolites are associated with. And then uh, we can find ones that have positive effects on immune, inflammation, and histamine-related pathways that we're interested in. And then ultimately, we can take those ingredients and incorporate them into the food and provide them for the pet. So we've talked a little bit about the idea of that the primary goal of the histogard complex is to modify the immune system, and we can accomplish this through that combination of egg, polyphenols uh, from green tea, apple, cranberry, uh, tea, green tea, uh, uh, for example, among others, and the antioxidants that we've already talked about as well. We've also discussed supporting skin and coat health and so let's and restoring the skin ba barrier. So let's expand upon that a little bit more as well. Skin and coat health requires not just a high number of nutrients, but those nutrients have to be in a correct balance as well. We've mentioned protein, vitamin A and E, and so now let's talk a little bit about uh, micro minerals such as zinc which is important in the metabolism of fatty acids, and it's essential for immune, inflammatory, and vitamin A pathways. Copper is essential and plays an important role in coat color. Um, and I'm going to give you just a quick example uh, of the importance of great nutrition and balanced nutrition in uh, skin and coat health. This is Savannah. And uh, she has faded coat color. You might not appreciate it necessarily from this, this particular picture. She belongs to an extended family member of a Hills employee. And she had been in a home that happened to feed whatever food uh, happened to be on sale. And, uh, and if you look at her closely, you'll notice that even though she's a little over two years of age, she kind of has a very puppy look to her coat. It looks uh, somewhat dry, uh, not terribly luscious or anything like that. And uh, let's take a look at Savannah six months later. And you can see that she looks very different. Her coat is thicker and richer in color. It's a deeper color. Even though it's a slightly darker picture, you can really appreciate the fact that her browns are much more brown. Her coat is softer. And even though she's not a dog with atopic dermatitis, she's a wonderful example of how correctly balanced foods can have an amazing impact on skin and coat health. And again, this is where we started with Derm Defense, and then we built upon that. So lastly, let's talk a little bit about fatty acids. There's been uh, quite a bit of, of uh, interest out there, discussion out there, talk about the fact that uh, certain uh, ingredients are either better or worse for N3 or N6 fatty acids. I think what we tend to forget is that N6 fatty acids are fundamentally important in epidermal proliferation and mucosal healing. There are great sources of omega-6 fatty acids out there like whole flaxseed. Uh, and having adequate N6 fatty acid stores has been shown to reduce transepidermal water loss. We are all pretty familiar with that idea of N3 fatty acids and that when they're incorporated into cell membranes that they uh, again produce uh, less inflammatory acosinoids when that cell is uh, under stress. What's also important besides having the N6 and N3 fatty acids in there is the ratio. 
They're both profoundly important. And I'm going to illustrate that with this picture. Which one would you rather have? Assuming you like candy. <laughs> They're both two to one ratios. Right? So it's the balance as well as the quantity of fatty acids that, that counts. Both are important. And we have um, uh, incorporated into germ defense supplies and quantities of N6 and N3 fatty acids that are both adequate and at the appropriate ratio. We've paired those with antioxidants, lipoic acid, vitamin E, vitamin C, uh, uh, in excess or equal to amounts that are typically recommended for uh, patients with skin disease and canine atopic dermatitis. So that's it. I've talked to you uh, in a little bit about derm defense, uh, the technologies that have gone into it, uh, and what makes it a little different as far as the histogard complex. Uh, I'm sure that you would now like to hear a little bit about some of the clinical trial work that we've done, right? So let's discuss some of the clinical work that we performed last year. After preliminary work, uh, not only incorporating all the wonderful things into derm defense, making sure that it's incredibly tasty <laughs> uh, for our pet patients, we went ahead and took term derm defense into two external uh, clinical trials. At the time, it was only known to those clinics, uh, not as derm defense, but as a color-coded bag of experimental food. The first trial was a masked and controlled clinical trial where we enrolled dogs that had a history of canine atopic dermatitis, seasonal history. The second one was also dogs that had a seasonal history of uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, but those dogs had already started itching for the year. So in that first group of dogs, they weren't itchy yet. They had a history of being, e uh, being itchy season after season. Those dogs were divided into a derm defense group and a control food group. And then in the second group, those dogs also had a history of seasonally being itchy. And then uh, those dogs uh, were already itching for the season. All of those dogs consumed uh, derm defense. We enrolled dogs from 11 clinics across the Mid-Atlantic and the Midwestern states. The reason for that is we wanted um, a geographic area where uh, spring was happening at about the same time. So it wasn't that we didn't like other states or we didn't like Canada or anything like that. It was, it was more out of uh, looking for uh, seasonal consistency. We had veterinarians fill out questionnaires uh, concerning skin health, and they also provided us with a score for the level of pruritus in those particular patients. They scored 27 different body sites for erythema or skin redness, for skin thickening or lacanification, for excoriations, um, how deep those scratching was, and for hair loss or alopecia. The, the worst possible dog that we possibly could have seen would have been a score of 432. Uh, if we had summed that up, obviously, we weren't looking for those particular dogs in this, uh, in this study. And then the veterinarians also provided us with a pariah score, a score of 0 to 4. The test food was no slouch of a food. It was certainly balanced uh, per AFCO standards for uh, adult maintenance feeding and met uh, all the standards uh, for that. The foods contained similar amounts of protein, similar amounts of fat. Um, it was just the ingredients and the sources of those uh, levels that varied from between the two different uh, foods. So uh, fats and derm defense were sourced from soybean oil and flax and fish oil and chicken fat. Derm defense also contained a fruit and vegetable blend and then the botanicals that we've already previously discussed. Ultimately, we enrolled, four, uh, we had 44 dogs complete the controlled clinical trial, our pre-symptomatic clinical trial where they weren't itchy yet when they were enrolled. 22 of those dogs consumed derm defense, 22 of those dogs consumed our control food, and then we had 20 dogs complete the case series, the already itchy or symptomatic dogs uh, were enrolled in that particular arm of the study. We followed the not itchy yet dogs for about four months, and the dogs in the symptomatic arm uh, were with us for about two months. 
We did allow medications, partly because we were really curious as to how the behavior of the study ultimately would go. So we asked veterinarians to take very detailed notes, record all the medications that were given, the dosing regimen of those particular medications, uh, and, how that, and how that went throughout the study. We also didn't want to necessarily tell veterinarians how to manage their cases, because that's standard of care. We didn't want to withhold any medications for that reason. We had owners fill out questionnaires as well as the veterinarians uh, with regard to uh, acceptance of the food, how the, the dog's dermatological disease was impacting the family, uh, and the acceptance overall and the improvement, how itchy the dog was, that sort of thing. The recurrence rate overall in our not itchy uh, yet group over the four months of the study was actually quite high. And this was, an, a num this was a number that hadn't been previously published in the literature for seasonal uh, uh, dogs with uh, atopic dermatitis. So that uh, recurrence rate was about 82%. The symptomatic case series, so those were the 20 dogs that were already uh, showing clinical signs, already symptomatic. We had 20 of those dogs finish. As, uh, the derm defense was part of their multimodal therapy from the beginning. We weren't surprised that the vast majority of those dogs were on medications as well. 95% of those dogs were dispensed medication over the two months that we followed them. We grouped the medications that were given into four major categories. A topical containing a glucocorticoid, an antihistamine, a systemic glucocorticoid, or an immunosuppressant. We had a single dog in the control group that was uh, prescribed cyclosporine. We didn't allow uh, Epiquel as part of the treatment uh, protocol because it wasn't uniformly available to all of the clinics. So that was the only medication that we asked veterinarians not to use. So here's a polling question for you. What do you suppose happened when we started having dogs um, come in monthly for exams as part of our treatment protocol? I had mentioned, remember, that they were coming in monthly. This is in the pre-symptomatic group. Do you think that the dogs had milder symptoms? Do you think that veterinarians were treating dogs with different medications than we typically see with canine atopic dermatitis? Do you think they were treating the dogs earlier? Do you think the owners stopped coming back? Oh, 11% of the people love it. Uh, and do you think not much? The symptoms were pretty much uh, were similar to the symptomatic group. That was interesting. About 55%. Oh, 64%. Dogs had milder symptoms. 24%. Veterinarians were treating the dogs earlier. That is a yes and a no kind of question. It's one of those questions that sends you back to the teacher to go, I don't agree with your methodology on that one. <laughs> because uh, as part of our treatment uh, protocol, they were coming in monthly anyway. So yes, maybe they were treating them a little earlier than they would have if they were leaving the owners to their own devices about coming in. But we didn't see them coming in earlier than their one month uh, time points, even though they were welcome to do that if they needed to and if any dogs were having any symptoms they were encouraged to come in early. So yes, what we basically saw were that dogs had milder symptoms. Let's look at that. So this is a graph showing that skin health score for those pre-symptomatic dogs throughout the study. At their worst, their mean score was about nine, which is not terribly, terribly high. So earlier treatment definitely resulted in lower mean health scores in those patients. And we attributed that to the fact that they were coming in and being closely monitored. And essentially, a pretreatment protocol became part of our study, whether we liked it or not. Let's compare that just as a reference to the dogs coming in that were already itchy, which might be a more typical presentation for a dog in the spring with canine atopic dermatitis. Even these dogs. We had the veterinarians call the owners and say, we know your dog has a history. Can you please come in and participate in the study? Or they happen to be walking in the door. And there, the mean score at their worst was twice that, over twice that, what we saw in our pre-symptomatic group. 
Peretti scores followed suit. They were also, even at their worst, only about half, not terribly high and only about half. If you remember the score, they could score from zero to four. This is uh, only slightly over one for our pre-symptomatic group, uh, almost two and a half for the symptomatic group. So what we found was that early intervention, including derm defense, resulted in less frequent and fewer drugs administered overall. So what we saw among those dogs that did exhibit clinical signs during the course of the study, we did see differences. 94% of the control uh, food-fed dogs were prescribed a medication, a medication from one of those four groups that I talked about whereas only 68% of the derm defense dogs were uh, prescribed one of those medications. When we looked at multiple medications, they were getting medications from more than one of those four groups, 53% of the control food fed dogs versus 32% of the derm defense fed dogs. So, did seem to be changing uh, veterinarian behavior, which we were really excited to see. Let me talk you through this graph a little bit. What each box represents is a particular dog and when that dog would have been prescribed a systemic glucocorticoid uh, the first day that the dog received that particular medication. So for example, this dog over here uh, in the test group uh, received its first dose of a glucocorticoid on about day 30 whereas the first dog in the control group received their first dose of a systemic glucocorticoid on day 21 or 22. The mean time uh, before a systemic glucocorticoid was uh, prescribed to dogs in the derm defense group was about two weeks later than dogs in the control group, 105 days versus 90 days. This uh, effect seemed to be very uh, prevalent in the first half of the study. So this is the same graph I just showed you. It's just the first 70 days to really show you that uh, the prescription uh, of systemic glucocorticoids seemed to be very different between the two groups. When I overlay the other medications that veterinarians could uh, prescribe as well, what we see here is the circles being systemic antihistamines and the triangles being a topical glucocorticoid, that um, overall medication use was lower in the derm defense fed dogs. And uh, even though the mean time before starting a, a topical uh, was about the same, it was about 100 days, uh, it was later for antihistamines as well as the glu systemic glucocorticoids. So it was 62 days versus 55 days for uh, antihistamines, and again, 105 versus 90 days for systemic glucocorticoids. So in summary, peak skin scores were lower uh, with early, the early intervention that included derm defense as part of the treatment protocol. Overall, we saw about 26% uh, fewer derm defense dogs uh, that received a medication and 21% uh, fewer received multiple medications. Let's think about the dogs that were enrolled in this symptomatic uh, part of the study. So these dogs, um, were pre that presented with clinical signs, we saw overall 75% of them improved with skin and its itch scores when derm defense was part of their multimodal therapy. And we saw similar results reported from veterinarians and pet parents with regard to skin and coat health. So veterinarians reported improvements in coat shine texture, that's how soft the coat is, in shedding, decreased shedding, in better skin healing, less dander, better hair regrowth, and overall improvements in uh, coat and skin quality. Pet parents reported less redness, less itching, uh, less licking and head shaking, less disruption of the family, and overall improved quality of life. Let's look at two cases that came out of that symptomatic arm. This is Nixie, and uh, she was one of Dr. Roland's cases, and Dr. Roland is with us uh, uh, as part of this wonderful week. And um, Nixie was one of those dogs that came in with a history of itching her nose really badly. And uh, much like Dr. DeBoer uh, talked about the other day, uh, rather than itch her nose between seat cushions on the couch, she chose the floor, um, but they, her 
her owner said she would itch her nose so much on the carpet it would often cause it to bleed. Uh, and then after uh, being on Derm Defense, she seemed to be, want to be petted more, she was much more comfortable, and she wasn't distracted so much by all of that constant itching. This is Marcy. Marcy was a great case study because after she went home and finished the study, they said, yeah, we thought the food was pretty good. We were pretty pleased with it. Overall, everything went well. They contacted us a couple weeks later and said, actually, we think our experience was better than we had reported because she went home and went back on her original food and her coat reverted back to how it was. So the veterinarian commented that she had always had this dry, flaky, dandruffy skin. She always had this kind of inflamed ears and itching. When she was on study, she did much, much better. And that all resolved. And they really noticed it when she went back to where she had been before. Owner acceptance of uh, derm defense was really high. So we found uh, overall 65% of both owners and veterinarians believe that the food was somewhat too highly effective. Uh, owners also reported, 70% uh, of them reported that uh, they wanted to continue to use the food. They thought it was being helpful. And uh, I don't think they were eating it, but they reported, uh, almost 80% of them reported that the food was tasty, that their accept pet's acceptance of it was extremely high. So in summary, the recurrence rate for seasonal atopic dermatitis was high. It was over 80%. And pretreatment, including nutrition and frequent monitoring, uh, helped to limit and delay the use of some medications. Early intervention, including proactive veterinary visits, contributed to the success that our owners saw and that our veterinarians reported as well. And we feel that this is fundamental in empowering the clients to feel like they're getting a handle on the disease. And if they're feeling that way, then they're more likely to continue to do all of the therapies that you're uh, recommending. So we hope that in the future, reminder cards like this one uh, might be uh, replaced with uh, a reminder card that looks like this. <laughs> and if you happen to have a pet with year-round allergies, we hope that you will really appreciate the fact that Derm Defense can offer uh, a therapeutic uh, approach that, again, 100% compliance, because you're pretty sure you're your uh, pet parents are going to be feeding their pet every day. Um, and we really want Derm Defense and nutrition to be part of your multimodal treatment regimen because it's fundamental. So one last summary statement. We believe that nutrition is vital. It is vital as part of a pretreatment strategy in canine otopic dermatitis. We also believe that early intervention, including proactive veterinary visits, uh, and as well as derm defense, can contribute to success and empower your clients to feel like they're getting a real handle on their pet's disorder. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Or we're going to wait for the panel. I think we have a little time, so we can have one or two questions. And then we also have a <laughs> panel afterwards. So, uh, so go ahead. There's a person right here. Oh, and one there. So two questions, and then we'll. Uh... Hello. Okay. Um, do you know how long you'd have to withdraw the? Um, sorry. Do you know how long you'd have to stop the food in order to do a skin test? Like the veterinary dermatologists are going to perform skin testing. Their atopics are on the food. How long do we have to have that patient go back to the original food right. before our skin test is still so the, going the to? So the question is, will it affect um, a, a potential intradermal skin testing that you're doing? Right. When sense. we looked at the histamine control wheel, it was similar between all of the groups. So while I can't tell you exactly, because we haven't looked at that um, uh, clinically over a long period of time, I think we would probably say a Start with about a month and see where it gets from that. See where it gets you from there. Yeah. And I'm sorry, you had a. We'll do ladies first. We have a question here. It's not that important of a question. It's more a personal question. Um, if you were to have an omelet, it, would it be a regular egg omelet or a white egg? Or just it would the be white, a whole egg omelet. Whole egg, whole versus, egg omelet. Or just the white. That's right. Egg white omelet. 
What Whole would you egg have? omelet. <laughs> Scrambled. <laughs> Hi, I am a veterinary dermatologist in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I recently skin tested a dog on Derm Defense. Ah. Not thinking, I decided to continue it, and, or excuse me, I continued it before doing the testing and tested the dog, and it was really flat. And I don't often get flat skin tests, so I was really disappointed, and decided to retest the dog two weeks later, and the test was much better. So I know that doesn't, that's N of one, but with my experience, two weeks was so very helpful. So you had the dog off the food for two weeks? Yeah, I'd probably do longer next time, just because of what I've heard. I, someone said eight weeks recently, so i definitely give a little more time if I could. But I, two weeks did make a difference in my particular patient. I think our our conversations with you and other dermatologists and your experiences will help inform us on, on the best recommendation as we go forward. Great. Jen, we have one more with the cereal. Oh. I, got, I have a comment about the same thing. I've done six dogs now, and I haven't stopped the food. Oh. We need to up the microphone a little bit. Oh, is that better? There you go. Yeah, Thanks, perfect. Sorry. Thank you. So I've done six dogs now, and I didn't discontinue the food, and I've gotten beautiful allergy tests. So I don't know if there's a withdrawal period. All right, and there's much more questions to come uh, during our panel. So Jen will be in our panel, so if you have questions, think about questions. Big applause for Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks. Thanks.